Welcome back to the Daily Buzz 716. Our guest today is none other than the Bishop for the Catholic Diocese of Buffalo, the Most Reverend Richard J. Malone. Bishop Malone hails from Boston, Massachusetts and spent the bulk of his career in the Boston area before being appointed the Bishop of Portland, Maine in 2004. He served this position in Portland until being appointed the new Bishop of Buffalo Diocese in 2012. And we were so thrilled to welcome you. We are very fortunate to have him here with us today. And we want to welcome your excellency to the Daily Buzz 716. Welcome. And so thank thrilled you, you're thank here. Thank you all. It's a joy to be with you. Dude. I'm grateful to have been assigned here. I've been here five years. I know. And you're letting me stay. So no. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Buffalo, could you tell us how, how you yeah. came to be here? Um, I know Kelly is from Portland, and so she told us, ask you, because we want to know how you ended up from Portland to Buffalo. Well, it, it, <laughs> the, way, uh, the way it works in the Catholic Church is we don't, we don't apply for these positions. Oh, no? <laughs> no, you, you receive a phone call, actually. Wow. Um, the Pope uh, has in every country an, an ambassador. It's called the Apostolic Nuncio, but it's the Pope's embassy. And uh, how I ended up here was I was at a meeting back in May of uh, 2012 up in Portland, and I checked my voicemail, and it was this person who's the Pope's representative in Washington. And he said, is this Bishop Malone? I said, it is. And then he said, the Holy Father has appointed you Bishop of Buffalo. Do you accept? Oh, they, oh. Appoint, they appoint you with, oh without... That's how it happens. With no prior knowledge. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I, I never saw it coming. Wow. And of okay. course, I said, you know, I said, trusting in God's will for me, I'm, I'm happy to accept. How could you? Then how did the rest, how did the the rest of it well, take? Well, then, well, then I, <laughs> I hung up the phone. Well, what happened and, uh, and I said to myself, my first thought was, I don't think I know one single human being in Western New York. But that's changed happily. It Thanks took you to about a all week. All nice folks. <laughs> that's right. Did you aspire yeah. to be in leadership of the church before well, you got... I aspired to be a priest. I felt called to serve God as a parish priest. That's what I mm -hmm. wanted to do. That's why I went in the seminary. You, were, but, you, were, uh, you ra were raised in the Boston area? I was. I was raised in Beverly, Massachusetts. It's about 25 miles north of mm -hmm. Boston. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do, you, do you, um, <clears throat> the process of choosing someone for this position, is, can, you, can you speak to that process? Or, or is you know, just your, the experience is you're, you just get a phone call? Is, is it there, random? You know, are there, oh, no, it's not random. How, it's, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a good question, random. though. No, no it's, it's <laughs> a very, it's a no, very, I don't know. the process of uh, vetting, so to speak, mm -hmm. and due diligence can take up to a year or two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's, it's, there's a long, complicated process um, when there's an opening in a diocese for a new bishop, uh, sometimes they'll look around the country for someone who's already a bishop. That was, in my case, what, what happened. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they will select a priest and he'll then be ordained a bishop and sent there. So, uh, but there's a long process of um, all kinds of uh, questionnaires go out to people. 40, Not 50, to 60. you, but no, to the people no, around no. you. And the people who receive those questionnaires are supposed to keep that confidential mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but they, those questionnaires ask every imaginable question. They mm -hmm. want to know if the person uh, can be a, a good administrator. Is he, it's not the first question. Is he a good preacher? Is he mm -hmm. a good teacher? Can he relate with people? Mm -hmm. uh, does he have good moral character? Are there mm -hmm. any concerns about You know, there are so probably a hundred questions. Yeah, yeah. they yeah. really did. It's very complicated. Really then did. all that goes to Washington, to this ambassador of the Pope, and he will eventually send three names to the Vatican um, three names of priests or bishops who are being recommended. The Pope makes the final choice. Do they so ever I, know that they case, were it was, considered? It was Pope Benedict who yes. sent me here. Okay. Yeah. What, as a young man, what what do you feel? Um, what was that moment or that thing that that your heart said, "I need to go and to to be in the seminary. I need to be a priest." Well, it, you know, that's a good question. I'm often asked that question, mm -hmm. and it was not crystal clear from the beginning. I I was blessed to grow up in a very faith filled Catholic family. Mm -hmm. Um, our, our family life and our parish life were interwoven. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I was always exposed to very fine priests growing up and all that. Mm -hmm. But I, I w didn't always think I wanted to be a priest. I went through um, an FBI agent phase. <laughs> I did. And I wanted to be a, be a veterinarian, Good. take care of beautiful pups, beautiful dogs like this. I wanted to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. But by the time I was a uh, oh, junior or senior in high school, I was more and more focused on, on the priesthood, on, on ministry. And then, of course, you have a long time. It's eight years after high school to uh, 
reflect on that. Right. And, Eight years know, after high school. Yeah, yeah, four years of college and four years of seminary. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. And so many and it can parents. can even take longer than that sometimes. So many parents, when, when I was a kid, would pray for their child to have a vocation. Mm -hmm. You know, pray for their sons to join the priesthood. Pray for their daughters to join the uh, the convent. And it's it's kind of remarkable that so many people uh, of my generation did join. Mm -hmm. And how is that? How is that um, the difference between uh, priests of your era and the priests that we have now? Do you feel that there's a uh, a different, a different uh, sensibility? Focus? Well, I think I think it's that's a great question. It's, I think it's more challenging right now for, for a young man who's even thinking of uh, becoming a priest. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a time when I was pondering my vocation, uh, the, the, the Catholic culture, so to speak, was very strong, very robust. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people, as you say, w were praying that someone would become a priest and they were supportive of that. But our culture has shifted so much in mm -hmm. those years. Our culture has become more secular in many ways, yeah. mm -hmm. meaning a lot of folks, uh, you know, God's just not on the radar screen for a lot of people, good people. Yeah. But you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yes. Um, so I think, I think it's even more challenging and in some ways more sacrificial these days for a young man or a young woman considering being coming a sister mm -hmm. to, to make that move. There's not, not as much support you could assume. What's Why do you think that time? is? Yeah. Well, as I say, the culture has become less, uh, I think, less oriented toward God and toward religion mm -hmm. in many ways. I'm not, now, let me, as I say that, let me also say that coming here to Western New York, I have found what I feel is a very robust religious culture mm -hmm. here. Um, a lot of that is all the wonderful immigrant groups that we've had come to Western New York uh, through the years. Um, yesterday, <clears throat> I had a meeting with 300 Sisters of Mercy who were meeting at the Adams Mark Hotel for their, mm -hmm. their, their great big, uh, they call it a chapter, mm -hmm. when the religious meet. And uh, th that got started in Buffalo. You know, bishop Timon, yes. the founding bishop of the diocese 170 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, as soon as he became the first bishop, immediately he began to draw in these religious communities of sisters and priests. He was a Vincentian himself, that's yes. a religious order, so no surprise, he, he immediately started Niagara University, <laughs> which is uh, Vincentian. Mm -hmm. And your dog's name but is yeah. Timon, I so named my the dog connection. Timon, I know. <laughs> now, what would you say are some of the main differences between Portland and Buffalo, the communities? Well, um, of course, the Diocese of Portland, Maine, is the entire state of Maine, mm -hmm. 33,215 square miles but 90% forest. <laughs> so sometimes, sometimes, sometimes bishops from other parts of the diocese, like Rhode Island or someplace smaller, would say, Richard, you have a huge diocese. And I would say it's big, but because it's 90% forest, there's 90% of my diocese I never get a single complaint letter from. <laughs> No one complains about a bad sermon or anything. Just watch out for the moose and you're all set. But actually, um, even though we have beautiful and sometimes struggling rural areas here in western New York. Uh, Maine is primarily rural. Right. You've got, you've, you know, you've got a few significant cities, Portland, Bangor, uh, Lewiston, and some others, but uh, there's a lot of farms and potato farms and all that kind of thing. So there's a big difference between being here with the urban population. Yeah, different absolutely. culture. And, and, culture. and a larger Catholic yeah. pop in, in Maine, the whole population of the state, now I've been gone for five years, but it was about, a, when I was there, about 1.3, 1.4 million in the whole state, mm -hmm. and maybe 120,000 Catholics. We have over 600,000 Catholics in this diocese. It's a bigger responsibility. We have so, seven, seven Catholic So colleges. there. Yeah. So the responsibility so exactly. of, of being so the bishop like of Buffalo. Right. Get me ready for exactly. a, bigger, a bigger reality. So yeah. this huge responsibility of the, being the bishop of Buffalo. We're going to continue to discuss some of the challenges, but we have to take a short break. We'll be right back to continue our conversation with Bishop Richard Malone. Stay with us, please. Seven one six. We're continuing our conversation with B Bishop Richard Malone. Uh, Mercedes had a great question uh, to to pose to you. Yes, your position is a tricky one. Um, you have uh, 
Oh, well, actually, I'm sorry. You're both a spiritual leader, but you're also a financial manager of the diocese. Is it difficult to strike the balance between the spiritual and the more practical side yeah, of it? You, you bet it is. I, yeah. I tell people that uh, a bishop of, of the diocese is always two things at once. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is the bishop is the, is the chief shepherd of the flock. Mm -hmm. That's what's important theologically and everything else, to mm -hmm. be the pastor of the, sh the shepherd, you know. Yeah. But also in both church law and civil law, the bishop is the CEO of the whole thing, you know? So every day, when I go back to the office today, mm -hmm. there'll be legal documents to sign. You know, if a parish has a, let's say, has a, an extra building it doesn't need anymore, or it'll, uh, if they want to sell it, I have to sign up on all that stuff. Think that's any fun? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> but being out with the people is what's uh, fulfilling. So I am ultimately responsible uh, that we have the funding we need to do the work the Lord has given us to do. And what a great funding, great funding, great segment. Loads of other people who help me with that, of course. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's two or three hundred. Yeah. But um, this year, we want to talk a little bit about the Catholic Charities Appeal, often called the drive that never fails. And we're working very, <laughs> very hard these last 10 days mm -hmm. of the appeal. It ends on the 30th of June. Well, we had Sister Mary McGarrick I on, know. on our show a couple of months you know ago. All she about is it. Isn't she amazing? awesome. Oh my she gosh, is absolutely what a dynamo. Amazing. So, how, how close are you to we're, meeting your we're, goals? Well, we're, we're under where we need to be. The goal is 11 million, mm -hmm. and we're a little over 10.5 million. So, mm, we, need to, we need to raise yeah, several, still, hundred, several hundred thousand. Under. Well, you know, I, I tell people all the time that while there are generous folks, all over the place who want to help with important causes. I really never, this show doesn't go to most people in New England, so I can say, but anyway, but I, I have never met <laughs> as generous a community as I have found here in Western New York. Well, it's Buff it's Western remarkable. New York and Buffalo is called the city of good neighbors with very good reason. And as I say that, obviously there are generous folks every place, but, but not like in here it's, it's remarkable. And although yeah. it has the obviously the moniker of Catholic Charities, the contributions come from all denominations yeah. and corporations and, and the recipients. people not of our faith, but and the necessary. recipients oh, yes. are more than Catholic recipients. Yeah, Mercedes and I were talking you. a little Thank earlier about some of the programs, that's one right? Of the, that's one yeah. of the points we yeah. have to keep making. Some people mm -hmm. think because we're called Catholic Charities that it's only Catholics that we but serve. But that wouldn't we be serve very biblical, the majority, No, and the majority of people we serve are not Catholic. Mm -hmm. any, any race, any creed, any sexual orientation, you know, any religion, everybody where the need can come, and if we can serve, we serve. Can you tell us some of the services that people receive? Well, all kinds. We actually, I can't tell you too many because there are 70 of them. Oh, oh. So yeah. we have 70, That'll be a second We show. have Just 70 services in 61 locations in, all in Western New York. Uh, there's all kinds of counseling services, emergency assistance. We have programs to help young adults uh, in, in coming from poor backgrounds to get ready to apply for jobs, all kinds of mm -hmm. different things like that. You feed we, people, you we, clothe we have feed people, people, you counsel people, them. you yeah. house people. For us, for us in the Catholic Church, um, mm -hmm. and many people contribute besides Catholics, thank God, uh, it's a living out as for us Christians of Matthew 25, where Jesus says, I was hungry and you fed me, mm -hmm. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink, and the people say, when do we do that? And Jesus says, whenever you did it to one of my least brothers and sisters, you did it for me. And so we got to do it. Yep. And so we're hoping and we're praying and we're working hard right now to, to get the last few hundred thousand to get us over so we don't have to pull back. We don't want to, we always have to move forward, Mercedes, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. with stronger programs and not have to trim them. You know? yeah. yeah. We always the hear, need never gets less. We always um, hear about the issue of the Catholic schools closing, the religious schools closing, and the issue being that there is not enough, there are not enough attendees and there's not enough funding. No. Is that something that you're concerned with? Oh, it, absolutely. And it's the case in many of the old, older dioceses of the Northeast, where there had once been larger Catholic populations and all that. And um, many of us have, bishops have had the very difficult decision to have to close some of the schools. You get to a certain number of students, mm -hmm. and then there are questions, is it educationally viable? Uh, do we have enough tuition coming in, even with tuition assistance, mm -hmm. to pay the salary? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's the but worst. You know, it's the toughest decision a bishop has to make. It's a hard decision, but 
But times change, communities yeah. change, people move. People move yeah. from suburbs right. to the city, from the city to the suburbs. There are so many factors that, <clears throat> that go into play into closing a private Catholic yeah. school. And, and I'm convinced that that doesn't mean there are fewer religious folks mm. in the community. There are so many things that go into that that it's really uh, the community is diversifying in different mm -hmm. ways. It's so personal when when c schools are closed. I can remember the, the shockwave that went through the community when Holy Angels Academy closed. And that's my alma mater, and my uh, mother's alma mater, yeah. and my sisters and my aunts, and everyone took it so personally. Absolutely. And um, it was heartbreaking. Yeah. But, you know, obviously something that had to be done. Mm -hmm. And then um, sold to a, you know, private concern with Carol Palladino taking it over, making it a, mm -hmm. a, a school, a different style school, mm -hmm. which will be a debate. Well, having, uh, having said that, though, about the trauma and the tragedy of closing schools, we still have a very vibrant uh, Catholic school yes. system here in the diocese. And dedicated to. And, and very much so. Yeah. And I love to, one of my favorite things to do as bishop is to spend a day visiting the schools. We, oh, I we, we, I only have, we only have a couple of minutes left. And before we go, I want to um, bring it back to charity. Upon this rock is a different fundraiser than the, uh, the, the, the charity, the, the push that we spoke of to begin with. Please explain to us the difference. I sure will. The, uh, the Catholic Charities Appeal is an annual effort to bring in the money we need to operate Catholic Charities and do all these 70 different services. It comes in and it goes out. Uh, the, 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 the capital campaign we're just finishing now is an historic, you know, once in a lifetime kind of a thing to build, really to build endowments, you mm -hmm. know, not to spend it right away, but so that we can have those resources. So for ours, um, some of it will be to provide, interesting segue, uh, to provide tuition assistance so that parents who'd love to send their child to a Catholic school but can't afford it will have some assistance. Mm -hmm. um, we want to strengthen our communications assets with it. Uh, some of it will, will go to Catholic charities for an endowment, not to be spent right down. So there are many, many so those uh, evangelization, spreading of the faith. Those mm -hmm. endowments are a rock. They are exactly, build they on. are a rock to yeah. go yeah. for. For the future. For yes. the, exactly. Yeah. In yeah. Peter's words. <laughs> well, this is so exciting. And so many of the students that go to the Catholic schools now are not Catholics as well, which That's is something right. important to be That's noted. Right. Yeah. And a lot of them are influxes from different countries as mm -hmm. well. So I think that that's uh, very important for us to remember. And we're going to take a short break. We're going to be right back with to continue our conversation with Bishop Richard Malone. So please stay with us. Welcome back to the Daily Buzz 716. We're continuing our co exclusive interview with Bishop Richard Malone. But before we continue with the conversation, let's take a look at a short video featuring four men who were recently ordained to the priesthood. Uh, for me, uh, when I say yes to the priesthood, that means yes to being everyone's second. It's a different kind of yes, but one that uh, entails being present at every, uh, all the important moments of, of people's lives, from the moment of their birth to the moment of their death and, and everything in between. I might not be the most important person in their lives, but I will be an important second. And to be there and witness to those things and be present to those things, that's a great yes, and um, a wonderful yes, and a yes that I'm very much looking forward to. I've said yes to following God for the rest of my life. I've said yes to giving up my own will. I have said yes to giving up my own power. And to be a priest is to give up everything. Because anybody who is a priest and is not ready to lose everything, then he has lost everything already, including his soul. So I've said yes to God, and I'm ready for whatever that yes means. I am saying yes to um, where I feel that God is calling me, um, which in this instance is um, 
obviously priesthood, service, leading other people in uh, prayer, gathering them around the table of the Lord. Now God has a unique call, I think, for each one of us. And all we can do is wake up every day and say that, uh, you know, you are in control of my life and I give myself completely to you. Um, and that is my yes. I have said yes to handing over everything that I have and everything that I am, everything that I was and everything that I ever will be uh, completely to God. By giving over to God my, my life, my freedom, uh, my choices, that I will live a life of simplicity, that I will live a life of prayer. Uh, I am offering over everything that I have to God. And um, I simply hope that on the day of the ordination, I, in my whole life long, I hope that it will be enough. But the only one who can answer that is God. And I hope that he will make, I hope he will make it enough, this small offering of my life. That was amazing. Yeah. Very, very well done. It's uh, so many challenges in the priesthood and getting priests, and that was just a wonderful, wonderful uh, yeah, they, they are four, pitch, I guess. They're four <laughs> wonderful young men. Yeah. I, I got to know them well in the seminary mm -hmm. since I've been here. It's just I feel so good about it. The they, they, just, they just began their first parish assignment yesterday. And the one yesterday. priest is from Nigeria? Yes. Yeah. That's so I have um, actually a really serious question uh -oh. that, that um, I'd like to ask, and some folks in the studio are, are very interested in how you'll answer this question, Brace how you'll yourself. field this. Brace uh, yourself. I, I've fastened my seatbelt already. Okay. <laughs> are you a Patriots fan or a Bills fan? I have converted, <laughs> I have converted to the Bills. Ah, uh, yeah, converted. Who got here, credit for that? When I, came here for the, uh, <laughs> when I came here for the press conference five very years fast. ago announcing my appointment after the media <laughs> in town mm -hmm. ask all the important serious questions yeah. then came the sports questions we're not yeah and what's good and i told them i said i will always remain faithful to my red Sox, ah. always but i know i have to give up something nobody's ah. perfect i have, I have to tell you I, I have to tell you my brother bills. tommy is a red Sox fan and he can't can't get around that but Oh, it's Bills and Red Sox. We're not the first person to ask That's you that, right? That's me too. Right? No, yeah. no. Yeah. It's almost, a, it's almost <laughs> daily, Judge. Uh, uh, guys are not the first. I have yeah, another serious daily. question but for it's, you. But the fact that people get to know I'm a Red Sox fan <laughs> is bringing some of the other local yeah. Sox fans out of the closet. <laughs> they're, not, they're, not, they're not afraid to admit it you anymore. You started the growth. It, well. it makes it acceptable. <laughs> I have another serious question for you. It's not sports. <laughs> um, the, Catholic, the Catholic Church has had many struggles in the recent history over public perception, and for a long time, some priests who retire have been outpacing those entering the priesthood. Mm -hmm. So as of right now, do you think that people are struggling and distancing themselves from the church, or are we starting to see a comeback, as we heard from Father Joseph Gatto in his work at Christ the King Seminary? That's a question. Thank you for that, Mercy. I ask that question of myself all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of try to watch the dashboard, so to speak, of the church. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I think it's a mixed picture. I mean, we, we really are always trying to reach out in a, in a welcoming way to our good Catholic people who for different reasons, sometimes understandable, have kind of become distant yes. from the church. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people who are baptized Catholic, who are not practicing the faith, never really had much experience or knowledge of the faith growing up. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they would get baptized as infants and weren't really mm -hmm. reared in the faith very well. So they, they don't, have a, the don't have a basis, right, yeah, right. which is tragic. But what, what gives me great uh, encouragement is the, what's going on with our youth and young adults. We have every spring a youth convention at the Adams Mark with hundreds and hundreds of teenagers who come there for a weekend. It's a mixture of spirituality. You've got to have fun. You've got mm -hmm. to have your pizza. Mm -hmm. But they, they, have, they have, they worship together. They hear about the scriptures and they have a lot of, and I love spending time with them. So the more I'm around with the youth and the young Catholics in their 20s and 30s, the more heartened I am. You, you know, but, in, in relation to what Mercedes just asked you in, you know, this, this what seems like a, um, of the falling off in the numbers of folks who are going into the priesthood. I've heard lots of people say, well, gee, if they allowed the priests to marry, you'd find there were more priests. And um, I know you've heard this. And uh, tell, us, tell us where you're at with that. Well, may, maybe there would be, maybe there would not be. It's hard, to, it's hard to predict it. As you know, we do have in the Catholic Church uh, married priests. In the Catholic Church, we have what's called the Western tradition, which is what we Roman Catholics are, the Latin Church. You have and, married and, priests? Well, and then we have the Eastern Church, 
um, in many parts of the world, the priests in the Eastern Church, like Ukrainian Catholics, or uh, for those priests are allowed to marry. Mm -hmm. Didn't know that. Uh, oh yeah. And also in this country, or around the world, if an Episcopalian minister mm -hmm. uh, who's married decides to convert to become a Catholic and then wants to prepare to be ordained a priest, mm -hmm. he can be a priest mm -hmm. after preparation mm -hmm. and remain married. And still be so, a married yeah. man. So the, 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 the um, requirement of celibacy for priests is not a matter of church doctrine. In mm -hmm. other words, it's not something we have to believe, you know, like the resurrection of Christ and things like it's that. It's not negotiable. No, it's a, no yeah. it, exactly. It's what we call a discipline. It's it's a it's in the it's in the custom and law of the church. Be, there is a beautiful harmony mm -hmm. if a priest lives his priesthood well. Yes. You know, between his ministry and the, the celibate commitment, it, it allows us more of a freedom. You know, to mm -hmm. enter into friendship with God and not not have the the beautiful the beautiful uh, involvement with with family, which is what most people are called to. Yes. Yeah. So some of us are called to this. So, so whether there would be more men um, going to the seminary if they could marry, I don't know, yeah. perhaps. Building on that, it could change. Your, it's something that could change. What, is your, what are your thoughts on women becoming priests? That is a matter of doctrine. Right. It, 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 because I know Jesus, that the Pope, Pope has addressed it. Uh, yeah. It, well, the thing, the thing there is, of course, that uh, two things to say about that. Um, there are theological reasons for ordaining men, including the fact that Jesus chose the 12 apostles mm -hmm. um, and there are all kinds of more, more to it than that the priest represents Christ when he celebrates the Eucharist you know it's the symbolism of, of, of Christ who's a man all that stuff and people argue with all that for sure mm -hmm. but um, also when you think about it th some of the most significant and effective leaders in the church through the centuries have been women yes you, sir. you know the, the the presidents of some of our Catholic universities uh, some, some tremendous, powerful women among our saints. Mm -hmm. uh, so the women, the women of the church are, are are very, very important to the church's life. There's no question about it. And on that high note, <laughs> we're going to take a short break, and we'll be back with some more powerful women addressing questions with Bishop Richard <laughs> Malone. So please stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back to the Daily Buzz 716. We're continuing our conversation with His Excellency, the Bishop of the Diocese of Buffalo, Richard J. Malone. This is an awesome, awesome opportunity. Thank you so much for being here with You're us today. You're very welcome. We have more questions. If you so. keep calling me His Excellency, I'm going to yeah. call you Your Majesty. So yeah. be careful. That's where I was going with it. That's where I was going you with know, it. Talking about world affairs a little bit, this is a very uh, terrible time in, in history. I'm yeah. sure there's been other terrible times in past history, but the issue of war in the whole world, of terrorism and of people of one faith or another, um, murdering other people because they don't believe in their faith or for whatever sure. reason. Um, how are you dealing with this or wh what do you, well, I, what do you I, feel I, I couldn't optimistic agree. or pessimistic? Or? Well, I feel realistic but yeah. always hopeful. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, our, our Christian, our Catholic understanding uh, of the human person is that we are good and we are beautiful because we're created in God's image, so, right. you know, but that we're wounded. You know, we're, we're, there's a woundedness. Is what Catholics mean by original sin. Christians mean there's something in us that makes us imperfect and t tend to do things we shouldn't or not do the things we should. You know, mm -hmm. to put it in the simplest terms. Mm -hmm. So uh, while the human per person is good, we have the freedom to go the wrong way, and that's what we're seeing happen in, in so many ways. And I think that it's a very complex thing when you look at how religion figures into the violence and political realities and all of that. But all of the major religions of the world call us to live in peace with each other. All mm -hmm. of them do. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, when we fail to do that, we, we are being unfaithful to the tenets of our faith. There's it's no hard to keep the faith, it. you know? Yeah, well, with, we have to live the faith. This, That's yeah. the key, isn't it? Mm -hmm. To well, live it. You talk but about I, living the faith. It makes me think of our current pope. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, Protestant, I'm not Catholic, but I gotta tell you, I love this guy. Mm -hmm. I love this man. He's Is that such his Holy a man of the people. Yeah. Mary Kate, you love him too. I think he is the most magical person in the world. I just, <laughs> I was asking the bishop a few moments ago, I said, what is so spiritually magnetic about this wonderful man? 
Well, whatever it is, <laughs> <I'm> it, <in>. <laughs> fundamentally, <laughs> fundamentally, it's that his relationship with God is very deep and very real and just permeates his whole being. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Yeah. With Pope Francis, what you see is what you get. And I've, I've had the joy of meeting him personally twice. And uh, just when you meet him, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm in no way an important bishop in the, in the world's church at all. When I'm at the Vatican, I'm one among, you know. But even that, he doesn't know who I am when I go up and introduce myself among the 100 bishops. But even when you shake his hand, uh, he, he takes your hand in both of his. You know what I mean? Just a little gesture, yeah. mm -hmm. but just, you know what I mean? I do. Just a little more warmth and, uh, and a, a kind of an embrace there that makes you feel uh, special. So I think I, some of it's his personality. Mm -hmm. He just has a very charm, charming, warm, welcoming personality. That's a big piece of it. I love reading uh, the, the articles where it says he escaped the Vatican and went to a parish to say mass or yeah. went to a food, you know, a soup kitchen to yeah. feed people. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just so beautiful. That yeah. is just, it's, it's just, just so wonderful. how it should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. A mistake people make though, and I, with all due respect to Pope Francis, he's not the first Pope to be doing these things. Mm -hmm. Pope John Paul was out among the people constantly. Yes. Const always kissing babies. I mean, it's not new. It's just Francis mm -hmm. has a, a kind of a, an attractive personality, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. That says, uh, do not, well, one he's of He's magnetic. He is yeah. magnetic. Mm -hmm. There's no does question about it. Does he have critics that, uh, that think he's too progressive? Yes, or too <laughs> he does. Mm -hmm. And he has critics who think he's too conservative. <laughs> that's, I, that's probably, he does. It's that's a good thing. Yeah. 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 I, I, yeah. I love his approach to, um, to the gay community. He's, mm -hmm. he's been so open and he's loving. He's very embracing. And embracing, mm -hmm. yes, yes. It's, it's uh, so refreshing. Yes. And it's it continues so to be a, a big discussion sure. within, within the church, but I just, I think what, um, what the Pope brings to us is a simplicity of getting back to what it's really about. Exactly. And when he downsized everything in the Vatican, moving mm -hmm. to a chamber instead of his huge uh, his uh, apartments within the, and he moved to a smaller bedroom and drove a smaller car and, and mm -hmm. you know, the whole downsizing. Yeah. The impact was yeah, pretty the, the, those big. Sim, those yes. symbolic kind yes. of things really yeah. get to people. Of course, the Pope has said himself, he did not choose to uh, abandon the papal apartment because of splendor. <laughs> Apparently, I've never been in there myself, but they mm -hmm. say it's a very simple rooms where the po it, it's, a, it's in a beautiful building, but simple rooms, I'm told. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't that at all, he said himself, is he, he felt lonely in there. Aww. He, he, he uh -huh. wanted to be, I've stayed, the the where his, uh, I've stayed yeah. at the place where his residence is, Santa Marta. It's a guest house inside the Vatican. Mm -hmm. When I've been on Vatican business, I can stay there too. It's like an inn, like a nice. hotel, it's very nice. But he, uh, he, liked, he felt it, w it was better to be around people. People are in and out of there. Mm -hmm. you know? yes. mm -hmm. And uh, he enjoyed that more. He goes down to the dining room in that place. Yeah. We've got to and, talk about you know. some uh, modern media in the yes. church. We've got to go there because you've, you're doing some great things with that too, sir, with um, Daybreak TV Productions. Tell us about that. Well, Daybreak is our, is our television ministry of the Diocese of Buffalo. And uh, we're doing a, a lot of interesting things with that right now. I do a, a weekly uh, sh a YouTube shoot yeah. on all kinds of, if you've ever seen that. You heard all, it here first, on, folks. <laughs> on, on, I've been doing that now for two or three years. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. But on all kinds of topics, sometimes they're, oh, oh there we go. There there there's my are. chair. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, that's an ordination you're looking at right now. Nice. That was ordination from last year. But um, we do all kinds of things with it, and uh, we're grateful to have George with us now, who's helping us to move forward and fine tune everything. We're really trying now to enhance all of our social media. Yeah. But, but in so many ways, you, like the Pope, are moving where it's not so lonely, where the people are. Well, that's where we have to be. U on YouTube, on you know, the videos and approaching people, yeah. make it a more approachable that's church for everyone. I heard Bishop Malone tweet. I am a tweeter. A tweet. I, oh, no. Actually, I have to share something. But, uh, I know the Bishop, Bishop Malone do tweets. Tweet my niece Katie, who went to Sacred Heart, and she, you had given them a day off from school. Oh, no. Was she the do you remember? Yes. She was the one who tweeted you. I know. <laughs> I didn't tell you this oh. before I was telling George. You know, and Katie said, they're not holding up their end of the bargain. <laughs> we didn't get a day off. Mm -hmm. So when I went to Mass and you celebrated um, Mass in the, in the new gym there, yes, yeah. and, and you said from the pulpit, you said, Oh, and by the way, 
you are totally up your end of the bargain. You need to give these girls a day off. And they're all <laughs> sheared. Like, okay, baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, our, Catholic, our Catholic high schools have, have accustomed some of them to what's called the bishop's holiday. Mm -hmm. And when I yep. go there, but I never <laughs> announced that unless the principal was it. She did. It's okay. she did. She was she all she good. Did it, she yeah. was all good about it. Absolutely. Now we know why you're so comfortable here. You, you're going to come every day because you're used to being on television. Oh, no, no. We, well, we nice, want you to consider this. Right. Nice being with <laughs> Nice be with us every day. <laughs> so, Penny's booking you right yeah. now. <laughs> well, they're going to tune in one day, and instead of like all la ladies on the panel, there's going to be you. And, and then you they're going to shut it right yeah. down. Yeah. Believe me. I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> there's a big upcoming convention in July in Orlando, yeah. Florida, yeah. and this will be attended by over 2,000 3, 3, 3, leaders oh, exactly. of the Catholic community. And what does this um, convocation hope to accomplish? Well, thank, that's a great question question too. And you, uh, you people have prepared very well, I must say. The bishops of the United States in recent years, looking at kind of the religious landscape of our country, mm -hmm. some of the things you were bringing up before, mm -hmm. are there fewer people practicing the faith? Yeah. Um, why is it so many people, including Catholics, have struggled with some of our Catholic moral teachings mm -hmm. about the right to life or care for migrants, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So we decided to do a lot of research and try to study what was going on with all that, and it led to a decision to have this major convocation of Catholic leaders mm, this brilliant. 4th of July weekend, 3,000 wow. people. And we're gonna take a short break. We're gonna be right back with, to continue our conversation with Bishop Richard Malone, so please stay with us. We want to thank Bishop Malone for joining us today. And in closing, would you give us a quick blessing? May God bless you and keep you close to him, keep you happy, healthy, always. Thank Amen. you. And we'll pray Amen. for you as well. Thank, thank you. Thanks Please for watching do. the Daily Buzz 716. Please stay tuned and join us on all the multimedias. Bye now. <laughs>